This thing here is called a Van de Graaff generator, and it generates a large positive charge on this ball. It's one of the most beloved physics demonstrations because uh, it's the one where you can grab it and people's hair will stand up on end. Um, you can make sparks jump out of it. You can make it light up light bulbs that aren't touching it. Um, and you can make Franklin's Bells, a really cool demo that I'm going to do, ring. And although it seems complicated, we should look inside to see what's going on. So we can take this ball off. And we can see that there's a rubber band that runs around a plastic pulley that's really close to a metal comb. The metal comb connects up to the ball. As fancy as this is, it basically is the same physics as you scuffing your socks on the carpet in the winter. Two different materials, one has more of an affinity for electrons than the other, and when they rub against each other, electrons are transferred. Those electrons that are transferred are actually uh, pulled from the ball through the brass, through that comb, and they end up on this uh, rubber band, which then carries them down to a similar roller in a similar cone. And that comb is connected to the ground. So basically this is an efficient way of transporting electrons from up top down to the ground and then out into the, uh, the ground wire of the school. So that's how it develops the large charge. The next two topics, getting a little farther into electric potential and discussing something called an electric field, are simplifications we make so that we don't end up doing the same work repetitively as we look at how many charges behave in a certain environment. As before, I want to go back to gravity and use it as an example, since Coulomb's law and Newton's law of gravity are so similar. So I've drawn this planet here, it's supposed to be Earth, and I've drawn several masses around it. Notice that they're all at the same height above the Earth. Well, if we were going to go calculate how much gravitational force is on each of these, we would have to use Newton's law of gravity. And I've done the calculations for each color of the masses here. And you can't help but notice when you do it all in the same color that most of the equation is actually identical. Big G is the same in all of them. The mass of the planet is the same in all of them. The only thing that's really changing is the mass of each individual object. So we want to focus on the similarities between the objects here rather than the differences, because that could get us out of doing a lot of work. If we could look at the part of the equation that doesn't change, it gives us an idea about the environment the object's in rather than the unique circumstances of that. So we define something called the gravitational field. We just took Newton's law of gravity. The gravitational field is the force of gravity divided by the mass of whatever object we're talking about. And that cancels one of the masses out of our equation. And we're just left with the gravitational field as g, mass of the planet, divided by r squared. On the surface of the Earth, using the radius of the Earth and the mass of Earth, this ends up being 9.8. The gravitational field is a measure of the strength of the Earth's gravity, which is general to all objects the Earth is pulling on, not just one of them. That's why we care about it. We could draw something known as gravitational field lines that would help us keep track of the force of gravity at each location. I'm going to draw lines going into the Earth evenly spaced around it. And what this represents is how strong the force of gravity is at various distances from the Earth. We know it's stronger when you're close. We know it's weaker when you're farther away. And if you look at these lines, which are in the direction the force of gravity would be at every location, you can see that they're spreading out. 
just like gravity spreads out. So where the lines are closer together, you have a stronger force. Where they're more spread out, you have a weaker force. And that means the field is strongest when they're closest together. So we could go through and calculate what the field is at every distance from Earth. But the picture gives us a general idea of what's happening and represents how strong the field is. So it's even more important that we do this with the electric force. Let's say on my Van de Graaff generator, I put a positive charge all over my dome. Well, I've got a plus two here, a plus, a minus three, a minus two. These charges are all going to experience very different outcomes. Some are going to be attracted, some are going to be repelled. The strength of attraction and repulsion is going to be different. But the environment they're in is all the same. So it's important we keep track of the environmental effect versus the effect of individual charges. That's why the idea of gravitational field seems a little silly, but we really need it for electricity. The same location, which I represent its variables in yellow, can have a very different effect depending on your charge. We take the convention that the force on these charges, we draw the lines as if they were uh, a positive charge. So the electric field, we'd symbolize it as this. And we can see that it too is spreading out as we move away from the Van de Graaff generator. So electric field, it's the environmental effects of being near this positively charged Van de Graaff. And uh, that way, once we find those effects, which I've got in yellow, all we would need to get the electric force would be to multiply whatever charge we're talking about times the electric field that we calculated, the thing that's the same for all of them. So the point of that section was to talk about how the electric field and the gravitational field are descriptions of the space around either charges or mass. We saw that different charges brought near a charged object are going to experience very different electric forces. This one will be repelled because it's positive. This one will be attracted because it's negative. But the field is a description of the space. We can very easily convert from field to force by multiplying by our specific charge. I want to go off on this idea that the field describes the space around a charge. If you have a strong enough field near a charge and you bring other charges in, say on a grounded object, some really interesting things can happen. I'd like to show this with the Van de Graaff generator. What I'd like to show you today is that the distinction between insulators and conductors, it can really start to break down when we uh, put ourselves in situations where there's very, very large charges. The Van de Graaff generator we've seen before generates large charges. I actually don't know whether this one makes a positive or a negative charge. I'm going to assume it's positive. But between me and it is uh, a lot of air. And air is usually a pretty good insulator. If you have bare wires running through the air, as long as no one touches them, uh, electricity is probably not going to jump out of them. But of course, as we see with lightning, and this thing will produce lightning, um, air can break down and allow uh, electricity to move. Amounts of energy can, can transfer in an electric field as well. If the electric field gets large enough in a certain location, uh, no insulator can actually overcome the, uh, the energy that would be released if charge jumped and, and, and insulators will start to break down. What actually happens to the air between me and the Van de Graaff generator? It actually becomes uh, ionized. So the O2 molecules get ripped apart into O3 molecules. And O3, which we call ozone, actually has a charge on it. 
and then those O3 molecules can carry the electricity from one place to another. So essentially assuming this is positive, and the opposite arguments would be true if this was negative, um, the wand is wired to the Van de Graaff generator. The Van de Graaff generator, its green base and the wand are wired to the earth through this pin, which we call the ground pin. And because the earth has a lot of electrons, when this ball gets too high a charge, um, it will start to steal them through the earth, either from its base or from this wand. And we'll see a lightning bolt. So when I am relatively close, it makes lightning bolts fairly quickly, and they're not too big. The farther I go away, the less likely it is to happen, but when they happen, they're rather much. You can steal this from any nearby source of electrons, and it'll take the wand away. And it'll start to take it from its own base, which is also wired in here. It's also perfectly capable of taking electrons from me. Ow. I don't know if you could see that. That bolt from my hand. Um, it's not taking a huge amount of electrons, and that's why it's relatively safe for me to do. Now that we've seen how the Van de Graaff generator works, I think it might be worth taking another look at Coulomb's law. As we can see, Coulomb's law looks a lot like Newton's law of gravity. There's a couple differences. It depends on charge, Q, instead of mass, M. It's got a different constant, and it's a much larger constant, which is why for a small object like a, a proton or an electron, uh, it can have a huge electric force, but a very small gravity force. Um, in fact, in the atom, you don't really have to worry about gravity forces. Um, it's, the electric force is just so much bigger. There's this other key difference that gravity is only an attractive force, but we know negatives repel negatives and negatives attract positives, so electricity can go both ways. I wanted to show one last thing in this video. I wanted to show uh, Coulomb's law at work. Uh, we'll see what our Van de Graaff generator can do to put forces on objects near it. So here's the demonstration of this. When I charge up this Van de Graaff ball, the charges are going to go all around the dome. I'm going to drop these conductive pie pans right on top of the dome. I want you to watch what happens. Give it a little while to charge up. On a very dry day with a very big Van de Graaff ball, you can get these things going shooting off. But that was a pretty good demonstration. So discharge the Van de Graaff, and now we'll try to explain what just happened. We can see here the running Van de Graaff generator with its positively charged dome. And one of the principles of charges in a conductor is that they will arrange themselves to get as far away from each other as possible. That's why I have them spread outside the surface of the dome. But when we put the pie plates on, now there's even farther away from each other they can get because some of the charge can move into the pie plates. Now this may seem a little bit weird because you guys know that the positive charges are located in the nuclei of atoms. They can't move. The reason positive charges rearrange themselves in conductors though is that the electrons, the negatives, can move and they're going to redistribute themselves to get the positive charge up far away from each other as it possibly can. So I think I have to show you what I mean by that. So if this is running and I throw these neutral pie pans on, in the top pie pan, an electron is going to go scooching all the way down. And it will cancel out one of these 
uh, positive charges. Now, of course, when that happens, it's going to leave the Pi pin positive. And that's going to keep happening, and since the Van der Graaff is going to keep running, positive charge is going to continually be recreated, uh, and positive charges are going to show up all over this outer Pi plate. Maybe there won't be as many here. So that would be fine, except that these parts here are also on the outside of the stack, and they're going to acquire a positive charge too. And since you guys know positives and other positives repel each other, that's going to put an upward force on the top pie plate. And the process is just going to repeat itself until every plate is gone. So it's an elegant representation of the fact that charges can move around in conductors and charges will rearrange themselves so that they line up on the outer most place they can get because that's as far away from other charges of the same type as uh, they can be from each other. Coulomb's law and the idea of the electric field were most famously used in 1909 by Robert Milligan and Harvey Fletcher to discover what the charge is on an electron. It's a famous experiment called the oil drop experiment. And this is a picture of the de device they used. It enabled them to put an electric field inside it and therefore put forces on drops of oil that had charge on them. So. Here's a modified version of that picture. We have a positive charge up here, a negative charge down there. So we have this oil drop that gravity is going to be pulling down. And the uh, electric field, because there's a negative charge on this, is going to be pulling it up. So in order to figure out about what the charge is on the electron, all you have to do is a very simple sigma f equals ma equation. Uh, in order to solve. So let's look at this simplified problem. If Millikan has oil drops of a certain mass, which he found out through other experiments, um, and he put them in an electric field and saw that they balanced and uh, didn't go down or up at the following electric field values, the question is what are the charges on each drop? So it's just sigma F equals MA. We have an upward FE, a downward FG. And we plug in our new equation for electric force. Uh, the charge times the electric field. We then subtract our, our gravitational force, which actually is the same equation, but for gravity. The mass times the gravitational field. And we end up with an equation that uh, lets us solve for charge. So if you plug in the values that were given in the problem, you basically get multiples of this number. And that's how Millikan and Fletcher could say that the charge on the electron was this number. So that's called the elementary charge. Um, and every charge we ever experience is a multiple of this. It was a very big discovery about uh, how atoms and what they're made of behave.